Hi, everyone. Back for the last day of the third week of the Romanian Global Quantum Program. It has been a really exciting time, full of software boot camps, virtual lab tours, hardware lectures, exercises, assignments, now even career training with the career fair coming up next week. Today, it is my pleasure to have NKT Photonics and then um, first a keynote, then a virtual lab tour, and afterwards a software bootcamp by D-Wave to put into practice what you learned yesterday in the lecture. It is a great pleasure to introduce Oscar Sellerup Jensen from NKT Photonics. NKT Photonics is a supplier of high performance fiber lasers and photonic crystal fibers. And Oscar is the head of quantum at NKT Photonics. Oscar holds a PhD in nonlinear opt optical communication from the Technical University of Denmark. And since seven years, he has worked at NKT Photonics in a variety of commercial roles. Now he is the head of quantum activities, leading a great team of uh, which you will see various people today. Oscar, excited for your spotlight. Please take it away. Thank you. And likewise, excited to uh, be able to give um, this talk um, on these quantum devices. I uh, think oftentimes in these days, with all the talk of quantum computers, sensors, and clocks, we forget that we already have a, a quantum revolution that happened about 100 years ago that gave birth to some uh, very important uh, technologies that we may take for, uh, for granted at some times. I'm thinking, of course, of the uh, transistors and the atomic clocks, and uh, almost as important, the, the lasers, uh, which were born out of the first quantum revolution. So there's almost a, a, a philosophical uh, point to be made about using the quantum devices of the previous revolution in this new one, where they are finding their ways into uh, sensors and computers um, that you said uh, you will have um, some examples of next week and the, the week after uh, on how lasers are um, enabling uh, quantum computers in particular. So as you said, um, uh, I'm head of quantum here at NKT Photonics and NKT Photonics is first and foremost a fiber and laser company. Uh, but what I'll talk about today is how this technology, which has been uh, mostly found in industrial applications, be it cutting steel, uh, this is something that's done with uh, fiber lasers today, or metrology applications in the semicon sector, uh, but hasn't been too prevalent in the quantum um, side of things. Uh, up until now, uh, but now they are quickly finding their way in there and I'll give you some perspective and ideas to why that may be that they are uh, becoming the de facto standard in uh, quantum as well. Um, uh, so I'll hopefully convince you that uh, there's a good reason for that by the end of the talk today, but then I was also uh, asked if I could uh, give a little bit of um, ideas as to what it is that uh, someone like myself uh, do and if someone is interested in a similar career how one would go about uh, that um, and I'll do that at the end of the talk since I assume uh, I heard there was uh, something uh, many of you were interested in, in knowing about. Um, so I would actually like to start with talking about fiber lists and quantum uh, start to just briefly uh, put into perspective where are they usually found. And in almost all technologies today, you find lasers somewhere in the value chain. But for some quantum computing modalities, and I'm going to zoom in and then, and in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about their use in quantum computing, but they are just as prevalent in quantum sensing and metrology, if not more so. Um, but in quantum computing in particular, uh, you will find a lot of lasers in the ion trap type quantum computers or the neutral type quantum computers. You see two illustrations uh, of, of, of the, these technologies here. On the left, you have an example of an ion trap. Uh, this is uh, 
what you see with this chip and all these little fluorescent dots you see hovering above is just a, a magnified view of what's going on there. Each of these dots represent an ion that's trapped in an electronic potential, um, fluorescent blue light. So each of these blue dots, like pearls in the string, um, represents a physical qubit. And on the right, you have an example of an implementation of a neutral atom type uh, quantum system where each dot again here is a uh, fluorescent dot here represents a physical qubit. But as you can see, they are distinguishing themselves from the ion trap in that they are usually arranged in these uh, multi dimensional arrays that can be, in some cases, arbitrarily uh, shaped. Um, with the many benefits to follow. And both of these modalities use a large number of lasers for all sorts of operations that could be, as you see on this next slide here, that could be to trap the atoms, um, which is something that requires quite a lot of power per atom um, compared to other operations. And when I say a lot of power, I'm talking milliwatts per atom. So uh, in in terms of fiber lasers, not so much power. And that's actually already the first little hint um, to why fiber lasers are first now finding their way into these applications. Um, if you only need a few milliwatts, you can get that in many ways. Um, if you need to build a system that has thousands, if not a million um, active sites, then that few milliwatts suddenly become uh, very significant uh, power. And uh, that is where uh, the power scaling ability of fiber lasers uh, becomes very important. And then counterintuitive in some, you can actually cool stuff down by uh, shining lasers on them. In this case, uh, uh, cooling atoms in particular, you can do that if you are able to choose your wavelength very, very carefully and place it just the right uh, distance from the uh, fluorescence uh, uh, or the atomic transition in the atom. And you can slow down the atom in the direction you are shining it by, uh, as you can try illustrating here, you shine light onto the atom and it gets absorbed uh, when it's moving towards the direction of the beam. Uh, as you place the beam on the red side of the transition, it gets absorbed. And when it uh, emits its uh, a photon, it does that in all directions leading to a net loss in movement. And on an atomic scale, movement equals temperature. So if you move it to a halt using this technique, you can greatly reduce the uh, temperature of the atom. And then after that, you will sometimes remove it uh, or move it to uh, a dipole trap like the first one we discussed. And finally, uh, you would also use lasers to create so-called Rydberg atoms. A Rydberg atom is not an element you can find on the periodic table, rather it's uh, the designation we've given neutral atoms where the uh, outermost electron has been excited into an orbital that is just below the ionization um, energy uh, of, that, uh, of that atom. And in that state, which is a very carefully uh, chosen state, uh, the orbit can become many, many micrometers uh, uh, in diameter which allows these atoms that are typically spaced in the tens of micrometers apart to interact with each other, which is a key functionality when you're operating a quantum computer is to have your qubits able to, uh, so, so, so to say, speak to each other. All of these functionalities are, uh, require each their laser and type of laser. And for when we're talking quantum, computing and uh, it, the lasers have uh, some very stringent requirements on especially noise properties. And that you can get in many ways, but when the noise properties gets combined with very high power, that is where uh, you're running out of technologies that can continue to accommodate this. So what we've seen since, and we're not talking many years ago, that all that was required of the lasers used in these experiments was that they had certain technical properties like the line width, which specifies how pure the uh, laser light is, uh, the noise properties and the beam quality. 
Um, those were the main requirements. Um, and of course, having the right wavelength, but we'll get back to that. But the main requirements to conduct a quantum optics experiment. If you were doing research on qubits, uh, you would typically not be operating many qubits at a time. One or two qubits and the interaction between those was a quite typical experiment and that didn't require a lot of power uh, to do. Um, but as these things need to scale and not just talking the number of qubits, which is very closely related to scaling the power, um, you also need to scale the reliability because suddenly you are no longer just conducting an experiment with the purpose of writing a research paper at the end of it. Uh, you are building a quantum computer with the purpose of running it 24 seven and essentially making money off of it. And that is what many of these companies they do today. Um, uh, they want to have a system that they can set up and you or anybody else can go and execute that code on these machines at any time of day. So that calls for a, um, an added per, uh, aspect of reliability and also scalability in terms of um, can you scale these systems to ever greater um, uh, numbers of qubits. And this is something that fiber lasers do really, really well and have done for many years. It's just not until in very recent years that it has become paramount for um, the quantum optics community. So just to give you an example, and this is a somewhat made up example. Here, I'm giving you an example of um, a laser at 813 nanometers. That's not important. We could have chosen another system. In this case, 813, that would be a typical trapping wavelength. It's the magic wavelength for strontium uh, atoms. So if you want to make strontium qubits, you would typically use 813 nanometers to trap uh, your atoms. And a, here I'm assuming 10 milliwatts per trapped atoms. In reality, you're probably closer to four or five milliwatts uh, per atom, but just for the sake of the argument, I'm being a little bit conservative here. So if you want to, uh, trap 200 uh, physical qubits, you need about two watts uh, of power at the end. Um, 400 means four watts and so on. And just to compare to what you've usually been your work, what has usually been the workhorse in these applications, you would uh, find diode lasers and diode lasers compare uh, 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 combined with tapered amplifiers uh, will be um, a, a nice choice of uh, laser up to just a few watts. Beyond that, uh, you stop being able to scale the power. And that, and it goes again, uh, the same goes for a titanium sapphire laser. There are some practical limitations to how much power you can get out of these and still have uh, of fulfill the scalability requirements uh, of these systems in the long run. Um, and that is a returning theme here because fiber lasers they will run nice and cool for much higher powers than that than this um, which is why in already last year um, we were uh, supplying four watts out of the fiber laser platform at the, these wavelengths um, and we'll now continue to do so so our task at MKT photonics and other companies is to keep up with the roadmaps for scaling the number of qubits as they get ever more ambitious. So what is it about fiber lasers that sets them apart and allows them to scale better than uh, other platforms? And really, if you boil it down, it comes down to the thermal management um, in the laser system. So when I say the laser here, I mean be both the laser part, the actual light generation part, but also the amplification that comes afterwards because in order to make a high performing low noise laser, you have to run it um, at the lowest thermal load possible. Uh, that is how you make the lowest noise uh, laser. Then you can subsequently amplify that light and keep most of the noise properties. So first challenge is to make a laser that can run uh, without you know, any thermal um, uh, load if possible. And fibers make, uh, a 
uh, make for a very nice platform to make low um, low temperature lasers uh, because the fiber itself you can say that's in principle a solid state uh, medium that has been stretched uh, in length so uh, the volume the active volume from where power is dissipated becomes very very large and in addition to that since the distance from the center of the fiber to the surface is very very small you get a very high surface to volume ratio so any temp or any surplus energy which there will always be when you make a laser is very very easy to extract from the medium and this is ultimately what allows you to scale power and fiber lasers to these very very high uh, levels so when you make a uh, fiber laser, this is already a good starting platform, even if it's a low power laser, because when you get to these very high end uh, laser systems with low, uh, with low noise properties, uh, most of your noise contributions come from technical noise, such as uh, temperature fluctuations. So we place our uh, fiber lasers, which is a piece of active fiber with a small grating written into it. Uh, we place that in a. We are able to place that in a very thermally stabilized manner, and that is also because the way a fiber DFB is a, is the term uh, for the fiber lasers that we produce at Inkton Photonics has a cavity that's only a few millimeters long, and that has several benefits. First, it allows for the entire cavity to be very well isolated, very easy to put it in an isolated environment. So the downside to that is that we also have uh, low uh, um, uh, what we say we have your ability to affect the cavity with temperature is very low, which is how you would often tune other types of lasers such as a diode laser. You can tune that by changing the temperature. The fiber laser is not very easy to change the wavelength in any way. We can mostly just do it by stretching the fiber a little bit. So the downside is you lose something on tunability, but that doesn't matter much for the quantum optics world, where typically you know the uh, transitions you're trying to hit with several uh, digits uh, on the nanometer. Um, so there, it, it's, it's not, uh, what, what you do prefer is a thermally isolated uh, fiber cavity. So where the, the other aspect where the thermal uh, management of a fiber becomes very important is in the subsequent amplification where you are scaling the powers to these typically multiple watts and in some cases even up to hundreds or even kilowatts of power and there you really benefit from the uh, long fiber uh, where to distribute the thermal load uh, and the high surface to volume ratio and at NKT photonics we do we go one step further than this in that we produce a special type of fiber called a photonic crystal fiber. And a photonic crystal fiber distinct, um, sets itself apart from a standard type of fiber in that the refractive index difference or the contrast in refractive index that gives you the, uh, the guiding properties of the fiber is made up of air holes in the cladding. So we reduce the refractive index in the cladding uh, by adding holes to it. And this has many uh, advantages. Uh, the properties of the fiber can be very carefully tailored and allows us to make mode field diameters that are very large while still being single mode. And single mode relates to the beam quality that I mentioned in the previous slide is very important for almost all quantum applications. So a large mode field diameter is directly proportional to the power handling capabilities of fiber. So with photonic crystal fibers, you get the highest possible power handling uh, of any fiber type. In addition to that, we also make a type of fiber called a hollow core fiber. Hollow core fiber, where a traditional or other types of fiber guides light in the part of the fiber where the refractive index is highest, highest a hollow core fiber guides light where it's lowest in the middle, where there is uh, no fiber material present. Um, and that is possible by carefully designing the pattern that makes up this cladding. You can see that that's the left of the two pictures of fiber you see here. There's an example of a hollow core implementation. And hollow core fibers have 
because light is guided uh, without or with very little interaction with the material itself, has enormous power handling capabilities and also allows you to guide types of light such as UV light that is otherwise very prohibitive uh, in fiber because it breaks down the glass that is it's guided in. In holocaust fiber should have none of these issues as well as no nonlinearities. Um, so with these two fiber platforms, we can scale uh, not only the laser power, but we can also deliver it in a convenient package with the fiber at the very end, even at very, very high laser powers. So of course, this is a very attractive issue of trying to scale a quantum computer. And just to give an example of how much power scaling difference we're talking about here, on the top left where it says PM980, this is typical fiber used in a fiber uh, amplifier around the, the 10, 60 nanometer, uh, where you can see it has an effective mode error about 30 micrometers. And what we do with our photonic crystal fibers is that we can scale this single mode um, beam to um, an area that is orders of magnitude higher than that. And by um, and as a result, scale the power um, in a similar fashion. Yeah. And this is called technology bus. So it goes too far as even producing the glass that we put into the fibers itself um, and create the fibers and ultimately the lasers uh, based on these fiber systems. And this is, um, if I if I had to put up something, this is the core of what we do here at NKT Photonics and something you will see more about in the lab tour. Um, and then I think we are getting close uh, to the end of the talk here. So just want to make a point about, you know, I, I, I talked a lot about the benefits of fiber lasers, but I forgot to mention that the downside of fiber lasers is that they come at the wrong wavelengths if you want to do quantum optics experiments. Fiber lasers are almost exclusively an exercise that goes on in the infrared part of the spectrum, um, which of course makes them uh, very useless uh, if you want to address atomic transitions, which are typically in the visible or UV part of the spectrum. So obviously we need to convert the frequency from the infrared to the UV, but in doing so, you, are often, uh, you often enter into the, um, how you, you, you benefit from the cocktail effect of converting uh, light to uh, shorter wavelengths. Whenever you convert light uh, with nonlinear optics, you benefit from uh, the bandpass uh, band filter effect that nonlinear optics gives you, which means that, oh, in, in essence means that uh, frequency conversion only really works for high power. So this is also not something that is uh, necessarily attractive if you are doing low power experiments, but as you get to high power experiments, you start to get into a realm where this becomes increasingly uh, attractive. And that has many benefits. It reduces some of the noise that is in lasers. Um, whenever you make a laser, you can't avoid generating something called ASE, Amplified Spontaneous Emission. And when you convert light, you get rid of that. So you end up with a more pristine laser light in the end than you started out with. Um, and that is, of course, a huge benefit. And it also um, uh, then benefits from having our photonic crystal fibers as the fiber delivery option in the end. So um, going through infrared, uh, you get the benefit uh, whenever your frequency converts. So I've taken to saying that you should always frequency convert your lasers whenever possible. But having the seat lasers and all the hard optics, so to say, uh, in the infrared also allows you to benefit from the long history of very nice optics that has been developed for infrared for telecom. Um, and allows you to utilize the fact that glass that you often used for uh, reference cavities is much more transparent in the infrared. Your frequency combs that are used, for instance, if you make atomic clocks and sometimes also in quantum computers, um, are usually made in the infrared and with a lot of inconvenience converted to the visible when needed. And that can all be avoided when your starting point is lasers in the infrared. I hope that makes sense. So I'm actually, I think I'm a little bit uh, short on time here. So I'll skip through uh, the individual parts here. I think I covered the, the overall 
um, aspects of this. So just to get to this point and say, um, we started uh, this journey um, just three years ago of frequency converting our lasers to get them to where uh, the quantum optics community needed them to be. And so Drake can address most of the um, most used wavelengths um, in quantum optics. Today, you can see an example of our offering here at several watts uh, at, each, um, at each wavelength. So this will be uh, on top here, you see a nice representation of typical wavelengths used for either trapping or um, cooling or uh, making grid uh, atoms. So main takeaways um, for cold atom qubits, um, if you combine fiber lasers, fiber amplifiers, PCF technology, um, you have a very versatile cocktail that can address a lot of wavelengths with just a few infrared lasers. You should use infrared lasers as much as possible because of the reasons I gave with uh, much of the optics being more attractive to work with in the infrared. And therefore you should of course remember to frequency convert your lasers. Yeah, so that concludes um, the presentation of NKT returns from my side. And then I think I was also asked to maybe give um, uh, just a few ideas about, since a lot of the, uh, the audience here are people starting, just starting on the journey um, and their careers, um, to give my aspect on how you end up in going from doing a PhD in physics to ending up in uh, strategic marketing. Um, so I myself I have a PhD in physics and technical university of Denmark. Um, then I worked my way through uh, various sales roles, uh, as you can see here on the right, just to end up in strategic marketing or s and uh, if you will, uh, where I've done uh, market development and now I'm heading this uh, quantum initiative. Um, and I think when you are in academia, um, we are not, I was at least not uh, exposed to many of the functions that exist uh, in a company and certainly not uh, what goes on in marketing and what we do. Uh, so I would suggest anybody to consider going in uh, this direction, get some uh, commercial experience if you're interested in helping to plan the future of a company. Um, in, when you're working in strategic marketing, you are the focal point between sales engineering and the management. And contrary to what uh, some may believe, products are not something that engineers come up with in industry. And in university, you have the privilege of solving the problems that you choose. And a company, uh, they are most often something that is discovered uh, by the marketing and that there are a customer need. And this is something that we in strategic marketing spend our time uh, discovering what the needs of the customers are, defining what products are needed to address a certain market, certain uh, types of customers. Um, and then we hand that problem over to engineering with all the framework and all the boundaries. And it's then the engineer's job to um, come with the solution within that uh, boundary. Um, so if you're interested in, in that aspect um, of working in a company, as well as liking interacting with external stakeholders a lot, uh, I would say strongly suggest considering a career in, uh, in strategic marketing. Fantastic, Oscar. Thank you for this insightful talk. Can I ask right away about the last uh, slide about your own journey? Mm. What are the skills uh, that you as a PhD physicist had that you use in this strategic marketing role? And then what are the skills that, that you were never taught in, in physics, but that you need now? Yeah, uh, so starting maybe with the last part of the question, what are the skills that uh, uh, was needed to acquire to, to, to qualify for a job in strategic marketing? And that is, um, I would say when you, when you work in sales, so I highly recommend going through uh, sales or working in service or anything that's customer facing learning to extract the needs of the customer from the customer uh, and um, learning to put all your own ideas of what people need aside and really listen is the main 
skill one needs if you if you are to be successful in creating new products that the market actually wants uh, in the end. That is, I would say, the, the, the main skill. And that is not something that everybody is born with. I certainly wasn't, but working many years in sales uh, certainly helped. Um, and then the first part of the question, what is it about having a PhD in physics uh, that helps you in the other end? And if I had just had a commercial uh, background and no physics, uh, I think uh, my uh, skills at uh, inter inter interrogating the customers would have amounted to trying to figure out whether they needed a big laser or a small laser. Um, so having some technical uh, insight or at least being able to learn new things uh, that has a high technical level is the main uh, takeaway from um, having a, you know, a highly technical uh, academic background. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing. We have Haisa here, our team member responsible for the hardware lectures, virtual lab tours and career fair. And she has a double role today because she also works at NKT Photonics. Haisa, would you take would you like to take the lead in the further questions uh, to ask her? Um, yes, sure. Uh, about the line width uh, of the lasers, as well, uh, what's the line width of these lasers and how do you control them? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent question. I didn't go too much into the details of the seed lasers, but the DFB lasers that we employ, DFB stands for Distributed Feedback Fiber Lasers, and compared to a traditional view of a laser is that you have two mirrors and you place an active material in this cavity made up of the mirrors. We make our cavity uh, by writing directly into the fiber um, a distributed uh, cavity. So um, the, the active region of the fiber is a small defect in the middle of this um, uh, bracket grating. And because the grating or because the cavity is so small, the so-called free spectral range becomes very, very large. So that means the resonances of the cavity are very, very far apart in the spectrum. And that has uh, many implications, including uh, the line width. When, you're, when your cavity is so small, it's very, very easy to thermally manage. And as I said, noise is, uh, and when we come to these very low noise type of lasers, the noise is dominated or the line width is dominated by technical noise. So being able to thermally stabilize your laser becomes very important and that's helped along by having a very, very small uh, fiber cavity. Um, in addition to that, the fact that the free spectral range is so large because the cavity is small means that the laser has a very low tendency to mode hop. It is, in fact, very, very easy to keep the laser on one of these uh, narrow lines, um, precisely, when, uh, when beca precisely because of the way a DFB fiber is built up. So other types of lasers, like an external cavity diode laser, will have a high tendency to mode hop partly because the medium itself is th quite thermally sensitive. So any thermal fluctuations would make the wavelength uh, jump. Uh, but then again, the cavity is much larger. So the free spectral range is much smaller, which means that not only are you fighting against a thermal sensitivity, you're also fighting against uh, modes that are very, very uh, um, close to space. So they will always have a tendency to jump between these modes. And you see that as jumps in the wavelength of the laser. Um, and could you comment on all of these lasers that you mentioned, they are continuous wave uh, sources, right? So if you had a short pulse of fiber lasers, how could they provide like a very high power or energy? Okay, I can have you repeat that question again. Yes. Uh, could these fiber lasers, be pulsed and provide very high power and energy? Yes, so um, at NKT Photonics, uh, we have several product lines. Um, what I've talked about today has mostly been about the CW type lasers, but we have just like the CW lasers, we have fiber lasers that are femtosecond and picosecond pulsed. 
Um, but you can, but many of our customers do with our CW lasers is also to chop them up whenever longer pulses are needed. And yeah, that's uh, that's certainly possible. So fiber lasers can really accommodate all sorts of uh, laser operation. And just to uh, apologize for the for the uh, previous question, I don't think I actually mentioned what a typical line width was of these lasers. But depending a little bit on how you define the line width, I think for uh, typical definitions, we're talking about 100 hertz of line width um, out of a DFB type uh, fiber laser. Yeah. Yeah. After the laptop. Right, let's move on with the lab tour about which we're all really excited. Now we have the, the full team here, Oscar, Heisa, Alexander, Lucas, and Hugo. Would you like to give an introduction? Yes, I can start. So as most of you know, I'm part of the Humanium team, but uh, right now I'm, I'll be talking as an optical engineer at NKT Photonics. So I joined, joined NKT this year on February, and I work in the quantum solutions team there. And we provide laser solutions for the quantum industry. Hey, so yeah, my name is uh, Alexandre, and um, I have uh, I made a PhD in optics at the Technical University of uh, Denmark, uh, same as uh, Asger. And then I joined uh, last year uh, the team here at NKT Photonics. And on my side, I'm working mostly on the harmonic product line, so responsible for uh, frequency conversion uh, to target these different uh, interesting lines for quantum optics. Hi, my name is Lucas. Uh, I have a PhD in optical communications. Uh, I was an academic for multiple years working in the lab, dealing with uh, optical communications and optical amplifiers. And I have joined NKT recently in December last year as an optical engineer. And I'm in the lab uh, working on fiber delivery systems for our products. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Hugo. Um... So I also have a PhD uh, so in quantum optics from the Technical University of Denmark, so like uh, Alex and Asga. And uh, I've joined NKT Photonics two years ago. I'm a senior optical engineer now and I'm responsible for uh, the production of our DFB uh, fiber lasers. So by uh, producing black ratings in active fiber. Question to you, Oscar. What are two main skills or traits that you select if you choose new team members? At NKT Photonics, uh, or in particular in our quantum team, we are uh, quite interested in having a diverse team. And I guess it goes back to the saying, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Um, so for us, uh, we're not looking for a particular profile, uh, but we're looking to cover as many bases as possible. And then we cannot wait much longer. I am sharing also the YouTube link uh, to the lab tour in case people have some lag. Here we go. We will start the lab tour. Three, two, one, go. Welcome to NKT Photonics. My name is Thomas Olsen. I'm director of R&D for the Coherence product line. We're here to look at how uh, we develop the world's most silent lasers for uh, quantum applications how we develop fiber lasers, amplifiers, frequency conversion, fiber deliveries, and complete solutions for quantum and beyond. My name is Asger Jensen. I'm head of quantum here at NKT Photonics, and I'm standing in one of our many research labs. And in these labs, we develop the next generation of fiber amplifiers and fiber lasers. Fiber lasers and amplifiers uh, is a unique platform based on our photonic crystal fibers that allows you not only to scale power to incredible high powers compared to most other laser systems. Uh, but the fiber laser platform that seeds this whole thing is also, also has its own unique properties that lends itself very nicely to some of the uh, cutting edge technologies that you'll find fiber lasers in that could, for instance, be uh, quantum optics, where the extremely narrow line width and low noise properties and mode hop free tunability uh, lends itself very nicely to where quantum computers, quantum sensors, and quantum metrology systems needs to be over the next few years. Now we are going to what we call the UV room at NKT Photonics, and it's where we make the core component of uh, our product on the Coherence line, and this component is a raw fiber laser. So please uh, follow me into the UV room, and uh, safety first, so we use 
protection goggles because we have a high energy UV laser in them. So here we stand in the UV room. And uh, as I mentioned, we make the core components of the Coherus products, which is a raw fiber laser. And uh, this is also the first uh, product that uh, Coherus uh, sold back in the days. And the raw fiber laser consists of a laser cavity inscribed into a glass fiber. And this glass fiber is uh, active, so it has been doped with uh, atoms like uh, erbium, ytterbium, or thulium in order to provide the gain uh, energy for the laser. Um, so to uh, make this laser cavity, we uh, write uh, bright gratings with uh, high energy UV lasers. And uh, as you can see here, it's uh, our setup for UV writing, where the UV laser stand uh, behind the writing uh, station. And we have some optics to shape the beam and direct the beam onto the glass fiber. So once the beam, UV beam reach uh, the uh, station where the fiber is placed, on top of the fiber we have a phase mask. So the phase mask that we come and place on top of the fiber so that it creates interference pattern that would be inscribed into the, into the glass. For uh, making this laser cavity, we need a high reflector and an output coupler with a lower reflectivity so that we can direct the light out of the fiber cavity. And since we are always at the forefront of uh, fiber laser technology, we often uh, have the need for a spe specific equipment uh, in a uh, our production and uh, here in this uh, UV uh, room um, so that uh, we can make uh, new products and uh, in a more efficient way and in a more uh, reliable and sturdy way. So here is a, a production area. So there is a, a lot going on every day and all what we make in this room needs to be uh, sturdy and uh, uh, easy to use for the production technicians. And um, we have a lot of work to do to uh, get equipment that is uh, right for the job. And uh, for that, we have very nice collaboration with uh, our supplier of equipment, with who we often cooperate to develop the best piece of equipment for uh, our facilities. So a very important piece of equipment that we have here, beside the UV laser, um, are spectrum scanners to uh, check the quality of the process and of the product that we made here, which is a raw fiber laser. So on the screen here, you can see a real-time scan of the transmission through our raw fiber laser. And we can uh, clearly see uh, a dip in transmission that indicates the position of our grating. And this is a very important information for us in our production because we need to heat the right wavelengths for the laser we produce. And we have a bunch of parameters that uh, needs to be fulfilled um, when we are making our raw fiber laser. And with this equipment, we can test for that. After we've made the core of our product, being the raw fiber laser, we will bring it out here, which is the main production line of the Coherus fiber lasers. And now we need to build all of the supporting optics and electronics around the raw fiber laser. And um, the first thing we want to do is we want to fixate the raw fiber laser into what we call a substrate, which in this case is aluminum. Fixating the fiber laser will enable us to thermally control the temperature of the fiber laser. And since aluminum has a higher thermal expansion coefficient than glass, we can also make a coarse tuning of the wavelength of the fiber laser. Um, a lot of customers also want to be able to have a much faster wavelength tuning uh, to, for example, lock to an atom or whatever. And then we also supply a PSO, 
on this substrate. And so you could say you have the slow thermal tuning to do a coarse tuning of the wavelength, and then you will have a, a faster but smaller tuning using the PSOs to do the fine tuning and locking to, for example, an atomic transition. We still need to do a lot of other supporting optics and electronics before it's a module. And um, I have an example of this here. So the fiber laser is going to be spliced into what we call a module. This is our smallest module called a basic micro, where you have the fiber laser now inside a thermal shield. You have some pump diodes and you have some supporting optics. And you have a photodiode that will allow you to make an electronic feedback loop to stabilize the power. And the electronics also support stabilizing the temperature of the module. The smallest uh, basic micromodule is preferred by OEM customers who want to integrate the fiber laser into their own products. After a module has been spliced, it needs to be tested. First of all, to be calibrated. Uh, power-wise and wavelength-wise, but we also need to verify all of its performance parameters. And the calibration and uh, verification of performance parameters is done automatically. So we have built automatic test setups that will um, enable us to, to calibrate and uh, verify the performance of all of the modules. This is simply a must since the production volumes are increasing. So we see a steady increase year after year and optimization is our best strategy going forward. My name is Thomas and I work as an optical engineer in the amplifier team for the Coherus product line here at NKT Photonics. As the name suggests, our team uh, focuses on providing amplifier units for the Coherus single frequency fiber lasers that take their output power from milliwatt range into the watt range. And here's an example of such a unit. This is a um, Boostic HP unit, which is seeded by a Coherus Adjustic uh, laser lasing at 1560 uh, nanometers. And the reason we want to increase the output power is because we have customers who, on top of the excellent noise characteristics of uh, the Coherus fiber lasers, they also want a high output power for their application. This application could be, for example, optical trapping of neutral atoms, where the trap depth scales linearly with the intensity of the laser field. It could also be within the semiconductor industry, where our lasers are used for inspection purposes. It could be for LiDAR measurements of wind velocity, or it could be as a high power starting point for frequency conversion schemes. Inside um, our amplifier unit, the amplification takes place in an optical fiber that is doped with rare earth ions such as erbium, ytterbium or thulium, depending on the wavelength that you want to amplify. Inside the doped fiber, the signal light coming from the seed laser is combined with pump light, which is provide by, provided by high power diode lasers and the pump light excites the dopant ions into excited, in an, an excited state. And this then allows uh, amplification of the, uh, the signal light via stimulated emission. In principle, this process is fairly simple, but there is a big engineering challenge in optimizing your amplifier design um, within the physical limitations given by the absorption and emission spectra of the dopant ions. On top of that, the system needs to be able to handle the high internal power levels and it also needs to uh, live up to the high reliability standards of um, the NKT Photonics products. Finally, the amplifier must preserve the excellent noise characteristics of the Coherus fiber lasers, whether you want to use the um, output of the amplifier as is or as part of a frequency conversion scheme. Hi, my name is Timur. I'm an optical engineer at NKT Photonics and Coherus Group. And in this group, I'm responsible for optical collimators, uh, fiber deliveries, and uh, harmonics production. So in my hands, I have a collimator. This is high power collimator, which is an interface between the fiber optical amplifier 
and free space. So it's very important that this uh, part has a very good pointing. The pointing, it means that the direction of the beam is very well defined. And this is very important in the application of our uh, amplifiers. For example, if something happens to your amplifier in your optical setup and then you replace it, if you take a new one, you plug it into your setup, and then the direction of the beam is, is at the same position where it was before. Now I will, uh, right now I don't have light here, but now I will insert it in our setup where we produce and uh, test these collimators and show how we measure the pointing. I'll put on my goggles, turn on the laser. Here in this setup I have two mirrors that are guiding the beam to the detector that records the position of the beam. What I will do, I will just rotate the collimator around its mechanical axis and record the position of the beam. Once I can see the circle that shows the trajectory of the beam, on the detector, and I could measure the, the size of the circle, I can define, I can measure the pointing and to, and to compare it with the specification. And I can see that this one, for example, is in spec. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Lukas. I'm an optical engineer here at NKT Photonics, and I'm working on designing fibers to deliver light from our light sources to any place you want, really. In this case, is our optical table. And I want to show you some experiments, some measurements that we do on, uh, on our fibers. What we are interested in is uh, low loss, uh, high degree of polarization, and we want the output beam uh, to be as close to Gaussian shaped as possible. Uh, let me put my light goggles on. Uh, so the first measurement I want to show you, and uh, we can see the beam is directed into our uh, M-squared machine. We will measure the quality uh, of the beam. So we have to wait a bit. So this device gives us uh, M squared measurements, uh, the divergence, uh, waste width, waste locations, all those parameters that show us if the beam is good or not. Uh, the measurement is ready and in our case the beam looks very good, very close to Gaussian shaped. Uh, let me show you now how we analyze the output polarization of the fiber. Let me flip this mirror here to guide the light into the polarimeter. So if you could look at the monitor on the right, it shows us the output polarization from the fiber. Uh, let me modify it now with a wave plate placed uh, in front of the fiber. Uh, we can see the polarization is rotating. It's also changing from linear uh, to elliptical. We can also see the degree of polarization. And this is some of the measurements we do uh, on the fiber delivery here at MKT. Thank you. So um, what we are going to show you in this lab is uh, how we do frequency conversion to uh, try and access some important lines used in, in, in modern um, quantum technologies. And um, um, the thing that we want to do here is uh, utilize the very nice properties that the DFB fiber lasers have in, in terms of low phase noise, narrow line width, and low um, amplitude noise, low RIN, and try and convert that from the infrared region, roughly between one and two microns, where they tend to operate, and then uh, try and access some uh, lines in the visible. And um, so, so what we have here is you see a rack where in this case we have um, two um, fiber lasers, one at 1.5 micron and one at 1 micron. And they, each of them output on the order of a few tens of milliwatt. And um, that is, an, um, uh, that is uh, connected to amplifiers that you see down here. So there's a 1 micron and a 1.5 micron amplifier. So that's an erbium doped uh, fiber amplifier and an erbium doped amplifier each can output roughly 15 watt. Um, and this is then coupled via other uh, fiber cables that you can see here into a, a harmonic conversion module. And um, uh, this module, uh, which you see 
here on, on the breadboard consist of two separate uh, frequency conversion systems. So the one micron, which is amplified in this case to something like um, something like 8 watt, uh, is then a frequency doubled to the green. And you can see, in fact, uh, there's some excess green leaving the module here. Um, but the main part of the green is actually coupled into the second module, where it is mixed with the 1.5 micron in a uh, difference frequency generation scheme. So there's a pole crystal that does DFG. And then what is produced is light at 840 nanometers. Um, and if we take a closer look at some of the outputs, you can take a, an IR card that is um, sensitive at 1.5 micron. So you can see here, you see the a mixture of green and, oops, and uh, the residual 1.5 micron. There's a lot of power, so actually create a bit of smoke. <laughs> and then we have the 840, which you see here. And then there is a residual green, which you see here. It's very powerful, so I try not to <laughs> burn too many cards. So 840 nanometers is an important um, uh, wavelength, for instance, for um, uh, rubidium quantum technologies. So here on this piece of paper, you can see the energy level diagram for uh, rubidium. And 840 could be used if you frequency double it uh, one step more. You generate 420, which is the first step in the Rydberg excitation uh, scheme for rubidium. Um, and the overall system architecture is um, shown here. So you have the um, 1550 or 1.5 micron boostic system consisting of the 1.5 micron DFB fiber laser and the amplifier which is then mixed in the DFD module with the second harmonic of the one micron uh, laser, which consists of the other laser plus the other amplifier, frequency doubled to green and then mixed in here. So hi, my name is Raissa and I'm an optical engineer at NKT Photonics. And here we are in the Quantum Solutions Lab. So in the Quantum Solutions Lab, we provide solutions for the quantum industry. <laughs> and we do it using the um, powerful characteristics of our laser systems. For the quantum co uh, community, a different range of wavelengths and requirement in optical power are needed. So for example, if we think about atomic systems platforms, so are cold atoms and trapped ion systems. And in this case, uh, the wavelength range can reach from UV to the infrared. Uh, other applications are, for example, photonic quantum computing systems. Uh, the requirement for the systems are also in the level of uh, how much optical power a laser system can deliver. And for quantum computing platforms based on atomic systems, uh, the level of optical power is scaled with the number of qubits that you have in your system. So, for example, uh, in neutral atoms qubits, if you want to go from 200 qubits to 2000 qubits, for example, you need to scale the optical power from 2 watts to 20 watts of optical power. But more than scaling, scaling the power, we are also developing here uh, integrated systems that can fit in this box that that fits in a rack system, in a rack system that you can use close to your uh, device. In this box, we in this acoustic model, we use uh, line card systems that uh, looks like this one here, for example. So they are very compact systems that can deliver uh, laser solutions, but also more than it, it can also produce like a phase modulation, acoustic, acoustic optic modulators, or variable optical attenuators. So all of these systems that we develop here can fit in this box uh, and you have a complete solution in an integrated system. So as KTKOAs, we use the best properties of the laser system developed at NKT Photonics as the low noise present in the laser, the high optical powers, and the frequency conversion systems 
and use it to probe cold atoms, trapped atoms, and photonic quantum computing systems. Uh, yes, yeah, so with it, we finalize our tour here at NKT Photonics, and I'd like to say thank you for taking this journey with us. Thank you. Thank you all for creating this really comprehensive and extensive lab tour with so many people from the company involved. And even here now, five people involved, including our own team member, Haisa. That is uh, really fantastic. Let's start the Q&A. There were so many topics in the video. So many parts were discussed. Yes, um, I can do it. So I will start with a broad question just to remove a bit the topic from quantum. Maybe Asger, could you tell us uh, where more we can use this laser that are not just for quantum applications? Yes, of course. So as you probably uh, now understand is that these lasers were not developed uh, for quantum originally. Uh, in fact, our main customers uh, who buy this type of lasers use them for something completely different. Uh, fiber sensing systems, uh, for instance, uh, is one place where you will find these. Uh, they buy thousands of these lasers and put them into deserts. They put them on submarines. They put them at the bottom of the ocean where they are responsible for detecting uh, small acoustic perturbations on the fibers that they are attached to. Um, in addition to that, you'll also find them in all sorts of uh, scientific experiments. The, I mean, think famously the uh, largest laser in the world, the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore is also seeded by one of these small fiber lasers uh, you saw. That is in fact the only laser uh, present in the largest laser in the world. The rest is just amplification. Briefly inserting a question. Uh, what is the biggest object you can do laser cooling on? Uh, good question. I think uh, we, we, of course, don't do laser cooling ourselves, but I know of, uh, I think, a, a small glass bead is the largest thing I've seen um, kept uh, trapped. Let's, let's say trapped rather than cooled here. Uh, with the with um, with a laser, that is pretty big. Yeah, that is pretty. Yeah, this related to the question from someone if they can finally um, cool their beer actually with lasers this time instead of with dilution refrigerators. Yesterday, I think if you could define uh, a good cooling wavelength for beer, uh, it should be possible. But I think that might be a challenge. Yeah, <laughs> new entrepreneurs coming up, and I, I love the creative discussion about that. Um, going to the next question, Heisa. Sure. Um, I think, Alex, could you comment more on the Freckles conversion scheme and like how it's done, uh, where do we start and where you finish in general? So, um, um... I'm, I'm not sure I understand fully your okay. question, but uh, <laughs> how, can... how does the frequency conversion scheme work? And in general, which way lamps like you start to it, and which way lamps you finish with, for example? So, so um, at the moment, um, we uh, use mainly the ethereum uh, wavelengths at uh, 10, 64, and around, and also the erbium dope uh, fibers around 15. 50 nanometers and around. And then we use the, we have a certain range that we can use above and beyond this wavelength. And uh, the whole thing is about uh, trying to find smart ways to convert these wavelengths into the lines that are interesting for uh, quantum applications. And there's different schemes that you can use for that. You can use a, a second harmonic generation, or we call it SHG. So you just divide the wavelength by two. So that would just take one laser. Then you can use multiple lasers in uh, what we call uh, difference frequency generation or some frequency generation. And that's just to do with how you combine two wavelengths and in the resulting wavelength. And the, the, um, then we have also some resonance systems uh, where we can uh, also just uh, create the, the same uh, second harmonic generation and, and divide the wavelength by two. Um, I don't know if this is clear enough, or if you want more details, I'm happy to comment. No, I think this is clear. Could you also comment on the optical power that we generate? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, in general, we start with uh, those uh, amplifier systems that you've seen in the videos uh, that can deliver uh, some something like 10 to 15 watt in general. Um, and then uh, obviously with uh, uh, 
frequency conversion, you're going to lose some power. And uh, the reason why we use such high power is because the frequency conversion in general is a nonlinear process. So if you have a very low power, you're not going con to convert uh, efficiently uh, your, your uh, input power into uh, the output power uh, at the, the wavelength that you're interested in. Uh, so that's why we, we require this uh, super high power to begin with. And then in general, for all the lines that um, uh, Asger mentioned in his presentation earlier, uh, we reach uh, a few watts of uh, output power for most of the lines. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Lucas, could you comment more on the MSPAR measurements, like uh, what it measures and uh, what kind of beam you are analyzing? Yes. Uh, okay, so M square measurement, originally we want a, a beam coming out of the fiber to be as close as Gaussian shape as possible. So M square measurement gives us uh, the ratio of how close the beam is to a Gaussian beam. A perfect Gaussian beam has an M square uh, ratio of equals to one. Uh, so we're trying to get as close as possible and we have as, our specs that tell us if the M square is too high, the beam is not good enough. And then we look for better solutions for our customers. Perfect. Uh, okay, I'll ask for Ugo now. So Ugo, we have some technical questions and some uh, people word with the UV laser. So you are using uh, glasses there, but why are you not using like protection equipment for your body in the UV system? Uh, so we have, uh, so when we, uh, when we use a UV laser, we have a, a window that we can slide uh, in front of the, of the setup so that we can enclose this setup completely. Um, then for the body, uh, we have lab coats. So if I need to service a, a UV laser, for example, it's a little bit more open. Um, and then I have my lab coats and gloves I can put in my hands. Perfect. And uh, we have the system that was blurred there. And this is because you cannot show the system for the ones that were very curious about it. But could you explain a bit more about how the process uh, happened in the UV room? Yes, so we have a... Uh, our fibers so that uh, are placed in, uh, in the setup. So we stretch the fiber so that we can uh, get the way to, uh, to uh, target the right wavelengths for our bright ratings. Um, then the, the beam from the UV laser is uh, shaped so that we can expose the fiber in a uniform manner. Um, and uh, between the beam and the the UV laser and the fiber, we have a phase mass so that creates the interference pattern uh, onto, the, onto the glass fiber. Um, and we have some amplitude mask also to uh, define the length of, uh, of our gradients. So we, we have recipes to reach uh, the, the, to make the best fiber laser. Okay. And I cannot say too much because <laughs> some of it is a secret recipe. Yeah. yeah, no, it's fine. Thank you. Uh, I think I have a question to Alex. Uh, to Alex. Uh, how do you deal with low efficiency conversion when working with frequency conversion? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the. Can you just repeat okay. once more? Sorry. How do you deal with low efficiency conversion when work with frequency conversion? with lower conversion efficiency. Yes. Um, I mean, that's uh, something that we try to avoid. I mean, we always uh, try and um, make our products so that we have the highest conversion efficiency. So um, uh, I'm not sure I can say way, way more about this, but all of the schemes that we use in our harmonic systems are meant to be uh, for uh, use that where, where we have the most conversion efficiency. So that's why we always use uh, larger power. And uh, usually most of our customers are interested anyways with uh, in, in larger powers. And, and it's, it's, uh, you, it's, it's just, um, if you see it this way, if you want, even if you're interested in uh, having a very low power at these given lines, um, in general, you can always use a high power and then you can split it for uh, uh, afterwards, uh, for any applications. And that allows you to, for example, have uh, multiple systems running in parallel or uh, trapping multiple qubits in parallel, uh, et cetera. So it's, 
it's in general we we always try and be in a in a, sp a space where we have the the best conversion efficiency. Okay, um, okay there is a, a lot of uh, comments here on how to start a company. Uh, with lasers for cooling the beer, but I think we are not doing it here uh, with our lasers, not right now, maybe in the near future. I also but, love uh, the discussion related to glasses. Uh, yes. For example, the, the Orca CEO, uh, they focus on photonic quantum computing. He was first into sunglasses, uh, inventing new coatings for that, and now CEO of a quantum computing company. So it is all not that far away. <laughs> so. Good. Um, yes, we have a question here. Can you turn down the fiber laser power to get like a plus classical or, or even single photons? Would you like to take it, Aspen? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and some of our customers do that. Uh, for sure. Um, you can, if, if you want, you can get in touch with us afterwards. We can provide references for customers who are doing exactly that. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I think I think I will ask a question about uh, transition. Those are main questions in, with regards to it in general. So most of you have a most of you know all of us have a PhD, right? And you did this transition from the academia to the industry. So uh, what? Let's say what are what made you take this decision and. Uh, Yes, how, how was this transition for all of you? Maybe you can start uh, with you, Ugu. Uh, yeah, I can say a bit. So my transition was a bit smooth uh, because I didn't jump directly into a company that, uh, that is doing a production like we are doing uh, at MKT Photonics. So I, was, I worked at the Metrology Institute uh, of Denmark, which is a uh, a private company, but uh, running uh, on a lot of public funding, and still doing uh, fundamental research on top of uh, on top of services of uh, metrology. So that's where reference for the meter or the kilogram are kept in Denmark. Um, and then, so it was a little bit smoother because I went from like uh, research to research, but research in a, in a private company. And now, uh, well, we are. This for in R and D, which is still related to uh, some research. So I wouldn't say it's too far from uh, academia, but the uh, yeah the state of mind is a little bit different. But uh, yeah, we are. Our aim is still to make money for the company, <laughs> so to make the best products so that they can be sold. Perfect. Uh, Lucas would like to go next in thirty seconds. Uh, yes, for me, the transition was I was a academic for seven years working in different groups. And as, as you work in the lab and you do experiments with different people, I would say networking is very important because the bigger your network is, the more you are exposed to the opportunities. What is what? I was a postdoc in UK. I made friends and then I got to know, oh, is it you in Denmark? So I moved in here and then did you, I learned, oh, there is this nice company just 10 kilometers away and KT Photonics. And uh, yeah, the job is still in the lab, but there is less administrative job. I don't have to apply for grants. I can just uh, focus on my research and deliver the results. So this is my journey. Yeah. Alex? Um, yeah, on my side, uh, uh, I would say the transition uh, went pretty smooth. Um, I actually uh, got hired within two weeks of uh, ending up my contract at the university. So it's, uh, uh, it's also about the network for sure. And uh, I applied with a friend of mine at the same time here, and we both got hired in the same office, which is quite nice. Um, I would say the biggest uh, change for me uh, was that uh, I was kind of, um, as a PhD, uh, you're uh, often working on your own stuff and uh, you feel kind of, uh, I, I guess for some of them, you can feel a bit isolated and uh, working on your own things and not finding solutions. And the really cool thing about joining uh, this company here is that we have a lot of engineers working on uh, different topics, but sometimes very similar. And uh, we, you can uh, get in the loop quite quick to solve your issues very fast and uh, not get stuck on uh, your own experiments. Mm -hmm. Well, look, and I ask a last question for Asgard, so we finalize. Yes, so 
I just see here that I have a new vehicle laser, vehicle laser, Asgard, for satellite optical communication at MKT Photonics. Could you say that again? Uh, vehicle laser. Oh my God, I don't know the name of the laser. <laughs> It's for our satellite communi optical communication. Do you know what kind of challenge this current technology is facing? Uh, if, I, if I understood your question, was it the uh, fiber lasers for the use in optical communication? Yes. And, and what have... is the challenge uh, yes. uh, with, with using fiber lasers in optical communication? What, is, that, is that the question? Yes, actually. All right. So, um, I hope I have just a few minutes to answer that question because uh, the funny backstory here is that the DFP, okay, the, the DFP lasers was the that we developed here at NQT Photonics was developed back in the 90s and the additional the initial idea was to address optical communication with these fiber lasers. But at the time, there was no need for something with that narrow uh, line width to find its way into uh, optical communication systems and fiber lasers are more expensive than a diode. Um, so it was never needed um, until now, I should say. So in fact, now we are finding a lot of interest from uh, the optical communication after 20 years of silence. Um, and the challenge uh, there, I think, is still, you know, it's more expensive than a diode, but there are uh, several groups working on solving that by using frequency combs to, in fact, expand the properties of the lasers to all the little lines that you need uh, to um, to address an optical communication system with just one fiber laser. Fantastic. Thank you very much all. This was a really great discussion, very insightful session. Thanks to all five of you for joining today. And we look forward to the further collaboration with NKT Photonics and many more exciting activities together. <laughs>